Lula McClure was born in Dublin in 1970 and is a full-time fiction writer and poet living in Galway County. She has published three collections of short fiction, three poetry collections, one in an anthology and one novel. Lula holds a BA in Irish from Trinity College Dublin and a Master's in Translation Studies, Irish English from Dublin City University. She has worked as an arts administrator in theatre and in a writer's centre. As a translator, as a bookseller, and also in the university library, Nula teaches creative writing on a part-time basis. Nula Lee Thanks very much. First of all, Dominic and all the neighbours for inviting me to come and read. Delighted to be in Limerick. Um, well, I love to read just a couple of months ago. Um, it's set in Dublin in 1980. It's told in the voice of a 10-year-old girl um, she's not named in the novel, but her mother's nickname for her is Little Miss Prim. Um, so I'll do that first and then I'll read some more. Your ma used up all the juice again. Last week you asked, could she get two cartons of orange from now on instead of only one? Because there was never any for you and your brother Liam. She went mad, shouting at you so much that you could see frothy bits at the sides of her mouth like the scurf that Liam calls Guinness water that floats on top of the river. <coughs> Do you think I'm made of money? Do you think I'm Rockefeller, she roared. She lost the cool within ten minutes. Okay, okay, I was only saying, she said. She called you a cheeky pup and said to get out of her sight. There's no juice left because your man knocked it back with her drink again. That means you have to get Liam ready for school and he'll keep saying, I want mammy. You like a drop of orange in the morning, even though it makes your throat creamy, it's refreshing. It goes well with toast and marmalade. You don't drink tea anymore. You gave it up two years ago when you were eight. First you stopped having sugar in your tea, and then you decide to not to drink it ever again. You think you feel better for it. Your ma loves a nice cup of tea. She likes it strong, strong enough to dry her mouth. Wheat tea is piss water, she says. But she doesn't say it in front of visitors, only to you and her friend, Cora. Cora is huge and has hands that are knotted like a bird's claws. Your ma doesn't mind, she thinks Cora is a marvel. She calls her a girl, but really, Cora must be about 50. Cora's husband, Noel, is a lousy Egypt. He has a preggy belly and sideburns like sweeping brushes. The state of him, your ma says. And Cora laughs, but then sometimes she doesn't laugh. Sometimes she's in love with Noel. You and Liam play Cora. You pick up your cups of milk with claw hands and say, indeed it is, and indeed it does, and anything strange or startling. That's the way Cora goes on. Your ma caught you at it before. Stop that, you brats, she said, but she laughed. You make a cup of tea for your ma and bring it up to her bedroom. It smells like dirty tights and talc in there in the mornings, and the air is always warm. Your ma's head is sticking out of the sheets and her cheeks are rosy. The baby lies beside her with dribbles falling from his mouth. Your ma's pink cheeks are called rod blossoms. Her and Cora say that, and she only gets them when she's after having a drink. She covers them with foundation if she has to go anywhere. She's so pale the rest of the time that you like her rod blossoms because they make her look happy. She was crying again last night. A cup of tea for you, you whisper, and she pulls herself up, groaning. The baby is asleep beside her in the bed. He's one in a bit, but he still won't sleep in a cot. Leave it there like a good girl, she says, pointing to the bedside table. She squeezes your hand and tries to give you a kiss, but you turn your head to one side because of the sour smell of her mouth. She drops your hand and pushes her away. Go on so, little Miss Grimm, she says. On the landing, you stop to look out at the river rushing below the window. Your house is special. It's built right on top of the river. The river wall is your wall. You've had two floods, but your ma doesn't want to move. She won't live in one of those matchboxes up in the town, she says, not for love nor money. You get Liam to breakfast ready and then pull him out of bed. His hair is all over the place, so you brush it down while he's eating. You do your own hair then and leave the hairbrush back on the counter for your ma. The brush has three types of hair stuck in it, yours, your ma's and Liam's. The baby Sarah's hair is so short it doesn't need brushing yet, and anyway, it's sort of knobbly and curly, so it wouldn't brush properly. Having to clean out Liam's lunchbox before you can put the lunch in delays you. That means you're late for meeting Gwen, and it's the last day of school before the summer holidays, and she'll walk on without you. Gwen is your best friend on earth. She's Welsh, 
and someday she always says she'll be leaving Dublin to go back there. And I notice a lot of writers in the room, so I'm going to read two writers' poems. I'll give you my last two. Thanks very much for listening. Um, I'm sure you all know Paul Durkin. But I know him just as a poet and as someone that I admire. Um, so if there's no truth in this poem, just in case. Just in case you're talking to me. <laughs> Tell me. Oh, I heard about you. Dancing with Paul Durkin. I saw Paul Durkin in the winding stair, fingering a book of love sonnets. Paul, I said, your poetry is filthy with longing. He said, would you like to dance? So breast to chest, we turned a Durkin-esque polka of long poems and harem scaring happenings around the book stacks. And oh, the heft of him. I won't be falling in love with you, I said. That's okay, Paul murmured. Love's not looking for me at the moment. We've fallen out. Our bodies collided into man-woman as we swung. Our clothes and skin sung into each other. Our legs a kicking chorus of dance, dance, dance. Paul spun me down the winding stairs, up across the bow of the halfpenny bridge, and spinning together, all our pages flew. <laughs> Bargain price of 12 euro each. And uh, this one is for all the writers in the room. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the pictures the Guardian used to run of writers' rooms. Um, there would just be a photograph of the desk, the writer wouldn't be there, and there'd be their bookshelves and whatever they had, pictures. And then the writer would write a little sort of a precy of their room and what they thought of remember. And some of them were just really conceited, so I wrote this after reading some. <laughs> The writer's room after the guardian's photographs. My desk was a present from Margaret Ashwood. <laughs> after Zen and the Art of Beauty was made and sold its first million, she said I needed a place to write other than the local bus shelter. <laughs> My view is of the bare wall, of course. The window and the street are too distracting for a mind as relentlessly creative as mine. The very leaves on the trees inspire me. I picked up the rug on a trek in Uzbekistan. And that Basque-shaped card is from Madonna. She just adored my last little offering, the sex of a good enough woman. <laughs> my chair, as you can see, is a bale of hay. I will always be a simple farmer's daughter, with that need to stay close to natural things. My oak shelves were salvaged from the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> my computer is Sony's latest, Trey Posh. But I, of course, prefer paper and ink. Then I bash out a final draft on my Remington and let my super editor deal with it all. Have you bought my new collection yet? Backpedaling from hell on my menstrual cycle. It's so that Paul Muldoon meets Wendy Cope with a dash of famous Seamus for gravitas. My agent says it'll be my biggest book to date. So I've left a space on the shelf for a few gongs. The T.S. Eliot, the Irish Times, the Nobel. I'll be content with whatever comes my way. Yes, it's in this humble room where I am unassailable that all the magic begins. <laughs>